Welcome to AQA A2 Spectroscopy Lesson 3B, where we look at Carbon-13 NMR. If you want to look in the textbook pages to help, then look at pages 143 to 145. If you haven't already watched the Lesson 3A in this series, which is Introduction to NMR, then go and watch that first before you watch this one. The lesson objectives for this lesson are to understand that nuclear magnetic resonance gives information about the position of carbon-13 or proton atoms in a molecule, Know the use of the delta scale for recording chemical shift and understand that chemical shift depends on the molecular environment. We talked about this in greater detail in the introduction video so I'm just going to skip over it briefly. For carbon-13 NMR you've got carbon-13 nuclei and they can be excited by using an external magnetic field where the energy that's um, given corresponds to the energy gap between the aligned and non-aligned nuclei. And the size of this energy gap differs depending on the electron density around each nuclei. So the important point for carbon-13 NMR is that the number of peaks in the NMR spectra is equal to the number of carbons in chemically different environments. And that's underlined because it's very important. You could have five ca uh, different carbons in a molecule, but if two of them were equivalent, they're in the same chemical environment, then you would only see four signals. So the first step in predicting what an NMR spectra for a given molecule is going to look like is to predict how many different environments you have for those carbons. So in these molecules here, if you look at this first one here, you can see that there's one, two, three different carbon environments. So in the NMR spectra, you would expect to see three different peaks because each of those three carbons that I've just highlighted are in a chemically different environment. So this one here, for example, has a OH group attached to it and then a CH2 group attached to it. And it also has two hydrogens on it. This one here will have two hydrogens on it, but it will have a CH2OH group on one side and it will have this carboxylic acid group on the other side. Whereas this third one here will have a double bond oxygen on it and an OH and then this CH2, CH2, OH. So that's three different environments, so you get three different peaks. Now this one at the bottom here, when you immediately look at it, you might think that there is one, two, three, four environments. And so that you would see four carbon peaks, sorry, four peaks in the carbon NMR. However, this molecule is symmetrical, so this carbon on the far left is in exactly the same environment as the carbon on the far right. So those two together will only give one peak. Likewise, these two in the middle are in the same environment, so they will give the same peak. So what you will actually see is two peaks in the carbon-13 NMR. So what I'd like you to do now is pause the video and just see if you can predict how many different carbon environments you would have in each of these examples. So for butane, for 2-chlorobutane, for benzene and for phenol. If you've not seen benzene and phenol before then it's what's called an aromatic compound and don't worry too much about it. So hopefully you've had a go at doing that. If you look at butane as our first example it's the same as the butene that we were looking at before because these two carbons here at the either end are exactly the same environment so you get one peak for that and these two here you get one peak so you get two peaks for butane for two chlorobutane however you've got these two end carbons are no longer equivalent because this one is next to a carbon with a Cl on whereas this one is an extra carbon that hasn't got a Cl on. So now you've got one, two, three, four different environments because these inner carbons are also different because this one has a Cl on and this one doesn't. Now benzene is a bit more tricky if you're not used to thinking about aromatic compounds but basically you'll only see one signal and the reason you only see one signal is because each of these carbons is exactly the same environment. For phenol, on the other hand, 
to this bottom right one, all these, whereas in benzene they were all equivalent, now they're not because this one here has got an OH group on, whereas the others haven't. So this one here is, is different to all the others. These two next to the OH are the same as each other because they have a carbon next to it with an OH off and then another carbon which connects to another carbon. And so does this one on the right hand side. So it's next to one with an OH and it's also next to another one. These two last examples might be slightly confusing because of the double bond, but the double bond isn't... All of those carbon-carbon bonds in the phenol ring are equivalent, and those double bonds are just a way that we draw it. Really, it should be drawn with a circle so that all those carbons are equivalent, so don't worry too much about the placement of the double bonds in the phenol. Step two, once you've predicted how many different carbon environments there is, is to predict each of the carbon's chemical shift. And we can do this because Different types of carbon will have different delta, depending on the electron density of surrounding the nucleus. So it depends on the groups next to it. So you can see here on the left-hand side, you've got the carbonyl. So the, the peaks that you will see on the left-hand side over here, round about 200, is going to be um, a carbonyl group by itself. Then just to the right of that, you've got your C double bondos next to an oxygen or next to a nitrogen. You've then got an aromatic region here, which is when we've got the benzene rings, like we just saw on the previous slide. And then to the right of that, which overlaps, but just to the right of the aromatic region, is you see double bonds, so you see double bonds. Then you've got a bit of a gap. And then around 60, we start seeing carbons with halogens on them, a carbon with a single bond oxygen, and a carbon with a nitrogen. And then furthest to the right, you've got the carbons which have just got a carbon next to it. They haven't got anything different other than another carbon. So if we look at this molecule here, and we look at carbon 1, that carbon has got an OH group next to it. And on the other side, it's got a CH2 group. So the CO is going to be around about here. So we'd expect that to be about 60 parts per million. Number two, on the other hand, has got a CH2 group next to it and another um, C double bond O on it. But it's not the one that's actually got the carbonyl on. It's only next to a carbonyl. So that means it's going to be in this CC region here. So it can be anywhere from about 10 to about 50. And then the third one here is an actual carbonyl group, but it's a carboxylic acid, so it's got an OH. So that's going to be round about here. So we'd expect it to be about 180. So on the next slide, we'll see if we're right. So on this slide, we can see that what we predicted is true. Because for the first one, for carbon 1, which is identified by the green, we said because it was just it was next to a CO, that it would be um, in this region here. So it would be around about 60. And in fact, it is. It's at 60 parts per million. Number 2, which is the orange, we said was just a CC, so it's going to be in this region here. And indeed, it's in the NMR spectra, it's found at 30, which is right in the middle of that range. And then number three, we said was a carboxylic acid, so it should be here, around about 180. And that's where we find it in the NMR spectra. And this is what the actual spectra looks like. So we've got a peak, as we predicted, around about 30. We've got one just underneath 60, so it's around about 60. And we got 1 180, so that's exactly what we predicted. So now we return to our lesson objectives. I just want you to read through them and just check that you understand all of those. If not, then re-watch the video or have a look at your textbook to make sure that you understand everything.